This is your radio novel. Hello and a cordial welcome to another radio novel. Our story, Uncle Silas, is about a man who had been a loved and respected member of a small community for many years until a much younger man arrived to upset the town and their favorite citizen and his lovely young niece with accusations of murder. This is the radio novel, Uncle Silas. Now to our radio novel, Uncle Silas. Eddie Ward had always been thought of as that bright young Ward boy, and it seemed as he grew older that he was going to prove the truth of that statement. Eddie was now studying for his bar examinations, and he thought taking a job with an insurance company would be good training for a future lawyer. The company sent Eddie out to investigate claims and all of the usual routine, and he was doing very well. So when the job took him to Somerville, he went, feeling no sense of the unusual, no feeling of apprehension. United Casualty wanted some facts to substantiate their claim in an auto accident, and Eddie was to get the facts. Somerville was a typical small New England town, and Eddie arrived around 2 o'clock in the afternoon. It was biting cold, and there were very few people on the main street. Eddie walked into a combination bar and diner to get some information. There weren't many people in there either, but the one man who made himself heard was leaning against the counter a bit unsteadily. A pleasant enough looking man, if one could see beyond the silly alcoholic grin. <laughs> Boy, I sure called the score on that one. Uh, excuse me. Oh, hello there. I was wondering if you could help me. Sure. Sure, I got enough to buy you one. Sit down, sir. No, 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 I didn't mean that. I want to find Silas Thorne. Who? Silas Thorne. Oh, you mean Uncle Silas. No, he's a grand old fellow. Just grand. Does he live around here? No. He lives out in the valley. He has a farm out there. Can you tell me how I can get out to his place? You're out there now? Sure, why not? Well, it won't be no good because he ain't there. There's a beautiful farm. He has rich bottom land. I used to be a farmer myself. Do you know that? He isn't at the farm. Where is he? Oh. Silas Thorne. Oh, good old Uncle Silas. Yeah, he's always helping somebody. It's Uncle Silas. You know... One night, I remember, he stayed all night with me, helping take care of a sick colt. Colt died, though. Died just like old Lady Atkinson. Same night, same ways. Same night, same way. Well, thanks for the information. I don't mention it. Glad to help. Hey, you ain't going, are you? I have to find your Uncle Silas. That's uh, a real fellow, Uncle Silas. Hey, what do you want to see him first? Just some business. Now, if you'll tell me where I can find uh, him. Excuse me. Uh, oh, hello. Hello, Jane. How's a kid? I heard you mention Uncle Silas. Silas Thorne? Yes. Well, maybe you can tell me where I can find him. Well, yes. He's down at his store. I'm going down that way myself. I'll be glad to show you if you want. Thanks. I'd appreciate it. It's not far. Well, goodbye, old pal. Well, goodbye, old pal. Goodbye. My car is just outside. I'll drive you. Oh, we can walk. Are you afraid to ride a block with a stranger? No, of course not. <laughs> Uncle Silas? What? Oh, hello, Janie. Uncle Silas, this man wants to see you about something. Howdy. Hello. He didn't know where to find you, and I had to come over to ask you if there was anything you wanted for supper. Anything special? Oh, supper I ain't even thought of yet. I just wouldn't leave it to you, as usual. <laughs> all right. I'll pick you up around five, then. All right, all right. Bye. Goodbye. Bye, Bye Janie. Nice girl. Yes, yes. Have a seat, Mr... Uh... What'd you say your name was? Ward. Eddie Ward. Well, sit down, Eddie. Get comfortable. Wait. Get off, cat. Get off. Get off that chair. Scat, Euclid. Scat. Uh, have a cookie. No, thanks. Mighty fine cookies. I got a special on them this week. Dime a dozen. Mr. Thorne, I'm from the United Casualty Company. Who's that? United Casualty. What do they sell? Peanuts? Didn't you get any of our letters about the accident you had? What accident's that? The automobile accident three months ago. Oh, oh, yes, yes, now I recall. Now I recall it. <laughs> Took me a minute there to place the name. 
Car insurance accident, yes, yes. Then you did get our letters? Oh, yes. Why didn't you answer them? Why, I didn't see no reason to. Was not nothing much interesting in them. Mm -hmm. Well, the people whose car you hit have a policy with our now, company. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Who says that I hit somebody's car? It's what the report showed, hit and run. Now, well, that's a criminal offense in this state, you know. I don't know any such thing. But there was a hearing held, and this was all settled a long time ago. You call a thing settled when my clients, a man, his wife, and their little daughter, are all in the hospital and have been ever since the accident? My gracious. Say, that's terrible, ain't it? Well, I'm glad you see it that way. Hurt bad, huh? They'll recover, but they've suffered a lot. Now, my suggestion to you is to make a settlement and never let the thing get to court, because according to the evidence, they've got you cold. Why, I don't see as how they do. Oh, come now, Mr. Thorne, let's be honest. Listen, I've never been anything else in my whole life. Honesty is the only way to be. Well, that's fine. Then you will admit your liability. I won't admit no such thing. The report shows I that... don't give a good whistle what your report shows. I'm telling you, it was nobody's fault. So nobody ought to pay nobody. Well, I'm sorry you feel that way, Mr. Thorne. That's how I feel, young fellow. It can mean jail for you, Mr. Thorne. Jail? That's huh? right. Now, ain't that a nice thing to do? Come into a fellow's store and threaten him? You don't give me any choice. And we have you cold. We're sure to get a criminal conviction. Sure you want to have a cookie? No, thanks. Mighty good. And they're fresh, too. Well, I guess that's that. I hate to, uh, I hate to put a man like you in jail. Uh, I always do my own worrying. I'll see you later. Just a minute, you. What? Stranger here, ain't you? Yes, I... Well, that is, I... Thought so. Well, I'm here to tell you Somerville don't like strangers coming in and threatening people. We take care of them if they do. Now, look here. Especially if it's a citizen like Uncle Silas. Now, don't try to... <clears throat> oh. Eddie's legs collapsed under him and he fell to the cold sidewalk of Somerville. The tall, lean man stood over him, a frown wrinkling his brow. Then he put something back in his pocket and picked Eddie up like a sack of meal. Staggering under his weight, the man walked across the street and into the small building lettered with the words, Somerville Courthouse, on the front. You are listening to the radio novel, Uncle Silas. Now, back to our radio novel, Uncle Silas. When things start happening, they happen fast. Eddie Ward had been in Somerville exactly one hour and had been beaten over the head with a sap and thrown into a small room with iron-barred windows. When Eddie came to, his head one throbbing ache, it took him a few minutes to orient himself. He was in jail, all right. And then he started to put up a fuss, demanding to know why and for what reason. The tall, lean man who had hit him finally came to the door, looked through the barred window, and announced himself as the town marshal. All right. Come on out. You're liable for a suit for false arrest, you know that. Don't know nothing of the sort. <laughs> you talk like a lawyer. And that's what I need right now. Yeah. And if you take my advice, you'll stay out of trouble. I haven't been in trouble. All right, all right. Just get out of here. Oh, go back to the farm, will you? What's that you say? Never mind. Hey, now go on, get out of here, and don't say nothing uh, against Uncle Silas. All right, all right. When Eddie left the local jug, he went to the tourist home just outside of town to spend the night. The next morning, Eddie went to work in the village records. Between the local weekly paper and the town clerk, he found out a lot. Silas Thorne not only owned the store in a 500-acre bottomland farm, but also operated a farm that once belonged to Kerry Atkinson. However, there was no record of ownership change in title on the Atkinson farm. It still belonged to Kerry Atkinson. Suddenly, the name Atkinson struck a familiar note. The second farm, the one that Silas Thorne owned, he had bought from the bank in the county seat of Phillipsburg. A phone call to the bank brought out an interesting fact. The bank had foreclosed on one Merton Frawley. And also in Eddie's records of the accident, Merton Frawley was the first person to the scene of the accident in which Silas was involved. All roads led to Mert, and Eddie knew where to find him. I'll never forget that night. What night? The night of the sick cult. <laughs> that, that's when I got my first good drink. You know, I wasn't so good at that, either. What was wrong with it? 
What's as good for that than for Madison? Old raw liquor. Ugh. I, I was there working over the colt, and Silas was helping me. He was fixing to pour some down a colt, and Silas, he says, says it's a shame to waste good liquor on a colt. And uh, when they fall up, huh? So, uh, Silas suggested you drink it, huh? Girl, Silas. <laughs> Just says I wouldn't worry. You know what he did? You know what he did? What? Well, he went so far as to rent my farmland. Just so as I could go in the hardware business. He paid cash, too. Ooh, that made it easy then, didn't it? Well, everything would have been all right. Except for a few things. Like what? Well, hard times, that's what I mean. Couldn't blame Silas for not being able to keep on r- renting the land during hard times. Can't blame a fellow for something he could have helped, could you? No. Yes, sir. If it hadn't been for good old Uncle Silas, I don't know what I'd do. You don't know how true that is. Well, I'm saying it. I ought to know. Yeah, yeah. Well, I have to be going on. No drink? Later, maybe. i got to see a guy. Well, don't have any accidents. I don't feel like seeing any accidents. Don't worry. I'll be careful. Oh, hello. Your uncle around? He just went down the street. You know when he's coming back? He won't be long. Mind if I wait? Of course not. Why do you hate Uncle Silas? I don't hate him. Well, dislike him, I mean. Hmm. Love me, love my uncle, huh? I didn't say that. Look, Jane, I don't dislike your uncle. I don't hate him. I'm just here to do a job. All right. Incidentally, who owns the farm where you two lived? Why, I do, I suppose. What do you mean, you suppose? Don't you know? Well, I let Uncle Silas take care of all the farm business. Don't you ever ask him what he does with the money? Well, no. Why should I? Uh, No reason, I suppose, but I think you should check up on your facts. What facts? Well, according to the records, a Kerry Atkinson owns your farm there. Oh, (laughs) is that what you mean? Well, that was my mother. You see, for some legal reason, she used her maiden name on the title to the farm. Kerry Atkinson? Mm Mm-hmm. That's my middle name, Jane Atkinson Thorne. Carrie Atkinson. In my mother's will, it stipulated that Uncle Silas would be my legal guardian, but that the farm would remain in trust for me until I wanted the title transferred. I guess Uncle Silas just never bothered to do it. I see. What's the matter? Nothing. You have such a funny look on your face. I was just thinking. Do you always look that way when you think? Preoccupied? Yeah, yeah. What is it? Is something wrong? Jane, I want to tell you the facts as I see them and then let you put them together. Go on. It's about your mother and the farm. I'm used to dealing in such things, so they don't seem as incredible or horrible to me. What are you talking about? I... Oh, you still here, young fella? Still here. He was just going to tell me something about mother and the farm. Go on, Eddie. No, I can wait. About the farm and your mother, eh? What was it, Eddie? You know, I've been thinking over that accident. Yeah. I always was a fair fellow, fair in anything. I'm glad to hear that. So I tell you what, you just tell that company of yours that we can have a hearing any time they want on damages and such. All right, I will. You see, what did I tell you? But uh, I'll go you one better, Mr. Thorne. Uh Uh-huh. That's you young fellas. Always want to go one better than the next fellow. I'll hold the hearing right here in town. As a matter of fact, I'll take a panel of three arbitrators, if it's all right with you, and we'll let those three decide just what justice is in this case. That way we'll save court costs, legal fees, and all the rest. You mean hold it right here? Right here in your store. All right. Tonight. You got all the facts you need? I got enough. All right, then it's all settled. Now, if you two young ones will take care of yourselves, I got to go across to the barber shop. <laughs> Going to get a haircut for the big hearing tonight. <laughs> You see, I told you he was fair. Yeah, he fell for it. Fell for what? He's clever, but he fell for it. Well, now I suppose you're going to trick him. No tricks, just facts. Look, I don't understand all this. Don't worry about it, you will. I'm just so confused. Sometimes I wish you hadn't come to Somerville. Do you? Just seems like you're trying to make trouble. Do you really wish I hadn't come? Well, I... All right, young fella, come on. Oh, it's you again. Come on. What's he done now? Never you mind. This ain't your business. We were just standing here talking. All I've done, Jane, is rooted out a few facts that some people don't want rooted out. What? No more talk. Now, come on. Where to this time? Never mind. Just move. Walt, what did he do? Plenty. Move. All right, all right.
And this time, you ain't going anywhere, and you ain't coming back. Walt, the town marshal, and his once again prisoner, Eddie Ward, drove out into the winter countryside. Then Walt stopped the car and ordered Eddie into the back seat, where he was tied up, blindfolded, and gagged. You are listening to the radio novel, Uncle Silas. Now back to our radio novel, Uncle Silas. Before he was gagged, Eddie warned the marshal of the seriousness of what he was doing and the consequences he would suffer. But as before, Walt said nothing, gave no reaction. After he was tied up, they drove some more, then finally pulled to a stop. His legs were untied and the marshal told him to walk while he guided him. They went through a door and his legs were tied up again. Eddie felt a dirty wooden floor under his feet, heard the dirt in the scraping of his shoes. The marshal went out and locked the door behind him. Is somebody in here? Mm. Mm. Who is it? How'd you get here? Uh, just a minute. Mm. Just hold still. His nuts are tight. Uh, here, I'll loosen uh, the thing in your mouth uh, first. Uh, there. Oh, thanks. Oh, what happened? That's too much to tell now. Listen, where are we? We're in Uncle Silas's store. What is this, the back room? Oh, it's the storeroom. The store was closed, but I came back to get some seasoning. What time is it? Why, well, it's uh, a little after seven. Why? Now, you do just as I say, will you? All right. I want you to bring Mert. Mert Frawley. I want you to bring him to this hearing tonight. Mert? That's right. But, but I don't... I have no time to tell you now. Just bring him in comparatively sober, if you can. Well, what about you? I'll be here. Now, you go on out. Get your seasoning and go before anybody else shows up. I'll see you at the hearing tonight. It's all so mysterious. Will you believe me and believe that I know what I'm doing? Yes. All right. I'll see you later. And don't forget to bring Mert. You sure that young fellow ain't going to show up? <laughs> sure, I'm sure. I got him tucked away. Did you do what I told you to? Well, no. You see, I couldn't. Come on in, Mert. It's all right. We're going to have a hearing. Uh, uh, who? Oh, hello, Uncle Silas. Walt. What'd you bring him for, Janie? Yeah, what'd you bring him for? Hold it, Silas. Well, I guess we're all assembled, aren't we? Hey, uh, it's a robber. I'll get him. E easy, easy, Walt. Ain't no robber at all. Put your gun away. That's a good idea. What was you standing back there in the dark for, young fella? Maybe no reason at all. Well, now that you're here, let's get this fool hearing business over with. Where are them three judges? Them three arbitrators you wanted? These three will do. What three? Jane, Mert, and Walt. Me. Oh. Well, now that seems fair enough. Go ahead, state your case. Well, sometimes, you know, you're too close to something, too close to a thing to see it in its true light. But I was a stranger. I wasn't warmed over with love and friendship, so I couldn't see the pieces. What pieces? The pieces of the puzzle. They all fit into place if you stop and analyze it. Well, Jane here is a good one with puzzles, young fella. She wasn't too good with this one. But you can't blame her for that. Now, let's start at the beginning and make it real short. You, Mr. Thorne, you and your brother both loved the same woman, Jane's mother, Carrie Atkinson. Yes. But from the facts, I think you each loved her in a different way. Anyway, your brother Will got the girl and the farm, then he went off to war and got himself killed, and that was fine, wasn't it? How can you say that? Let him go on, Janie. Let him talk. So after Will didn't come back, you thought you had a chance again, didn't you, Silas? And you just waited and waited, thinking that sometime, some way, an opportunity might come along, and it did. Hey, what's this all about? So one night during a bad winter, Carrie Atkinson, your brother's widow... Actually, Carrie Atkinson Thorne took sick with pneumonia and was in bad condition. That night, she took a turn for the worse, and you rushed out into the night trying to find a doctor, leaving Jane here alone with her dying mother. Is that right? Why, well, I guess it is. But no matter how hard you looked, you couldn't find her one, and because she didn't get medical attention, Jane's mother here died. Great stroke of luck, wasn't it? But you had your troubles, too. Everybody's got troubles, I figure. And one of them was Mert here. Me? Mr. Frawley, who do you go to for money when you need a drink? What's this all about? Uncle huh? Silas here. Who suggested you have your first drink? First drink? A long time ago. long time ago. Remember when it was? Oh, sure, sure. When was it? Well, it was the night, uh, the night of the sick cold. Who was there with you? Well, Uncle Silas was. He was there all night. 
Left early in the morning. You sure what night that was? Of course I'm sure. It was the night old lady Atkinson died, Mrs. Thorne, I mean. Sure, that was the night. What? Sure. Sure, I'm sure. Hey, right, what's this all about? Huh? You get the picture. You wanted the farm, didn't you, Uncle Silas? You wanted it enough to let your own brother's wife die of pneumonia while you were supposed to be out looking for the doctor. Instead, you had to have a place to wait while she died, so you conveniently found Mert's barn and waited there all night. Then went back to the house with a nice heroic story of spending the night looking for a doctor. That way you thought you'd get the farm. And you did in a way. But the hitch was Mert here. And you had to fix it so Mert wouldn't remember your being in the barn with him. So you coaxed him into a drink. And after that he kept drinking. And then you got the idea of a farm and the hardware business. You knew Mert wasn't enough of a businessman to run a hardware store, but you let him into it. You made it easy by renting his farm. Then you put on the pressure and he lost both. And you picked up the pieces for him and the store. Very nice. Uh, what's this all about? Huh? You had to keep him drinking. And the surest way to do that was to ruin him. And you got another bottom land farm in the deal. And there's the case. A greedy, swindling old man, a murderer, and you all love him. But the way he's done it, the best he can get legally is perhaps a charge of hit and run driving. What a laugh. Well, I've said it. Presented it. That's all I can do. I don't know what you plan to have Walt do with me, Mr. Thorne. But if you'll please unlock these handcuffs. Oh, no, you don't. You don't get away, you're my prisoner. Walt, no! What'd you push my arm for? You were going to shoot him. Sure I was. Unlock the cuffs, Walt. Huh? Unlock the cuffs. Take them off him. All right, if you say so. Hm. Thanks. You'll make a good lawyer, young fella. Yeah. Well, that's the verdict. None of you believe me. Ain't nobody stopping you from going. No. No. You. Aren't you going to get in? It's cold. Yeah. I've been waiting here in your car for an hour. I went back to the tourist home to pick up my shaving stuff. I believe you. I guess I've had little doubts all my life, but they didn't mean anything because they were all apart, all in little pieces. I guess I wouldn't even admit those doubts to myself. Yeah. What are you going to do now? I can't stay here. Can you give me a ride to the city? Sure. I'll come back sometime, but I can't stay now. You want to stop by your place now and pick up some clothes or something? No, I don't want to go back there. All right. <laughs> You all right? Yes. You look pale. What'll happen, to Uncle Silas? Oh, he'll get his. But you said the law couldn't touch him. No, oh, we'll work on the hit and run case, get the local hearing satisfied, and prosecute him for that. No one else I... will believe what you said about Uncle Silas. I'm sure they all love him too much. Well, you loved him, and you believed me. And little by little, the story will get out. It'll get out because we opened the crack. People will want to know why you left. Mert will repeat the story. Walt will let little things slip. Then the whole town will start to speculate and stop and think. I give Silas Thorne a year more in Somerville at the most. Then? Then Somerville will be too hot for him. But he won't leave. Because where can he run? He's too old to leave and start again. And that's how he'll pay. I see. And Silas knew it too. He's smart enough to know that's how it'll end. And he's caught. Can't leave, can't stay. I see what you mean. Like an empire crumbling. And all his friends turn against him. Lifelong friends. It won't be nice. No. I almost feel sorry for him. So do I, Janie. Radio novel, Uncle Silence.